Young Heroes of the Caribbean, Chapter 5. Education is more than school. As they settled into Sawdust's room that night, Ramiro raised the matter of his mother with his father. Who is going to help Lily? Ramiro had shared almost every single day of his life with his mother, sleeping on the same bed and sharing thoughts and conversation on most things except any matter that did not happen on the beach. He did not even know where she was from. When he was with his father, Ramiro tried to fill in the blanks that were left out of conversations with his mother. With sawdust, Ramiro felt comfortable to talk about many more topics, but his father had no time for exploring feelings. Your mother all right, Ramiro. She knows how to take care of herself. And you'll see her when you want. I want you to focus on making more friends. There's a football club near here and that has a league your age and I will take you there to the paddock and you can learn how to be a groom like me. I'm not saying anything against the beach life, but the cook shop thing is not going anywhere. It's a dead end, so put that life behind you. Ramiro was not sure he was any more comfortable lying alone in a bed behind concrete walls, sleeping and waking to the sounds of competing street dances straight through the night into the daylight, instead of lying beside his mother, quietly discussing whether the wind coming in from the west meant a sign of bad weather. Nonetheless, he found himself captivated by his father and thrust himself away from his mother's gravitational pull that had kept him in a steady orbit around her until now. Now he saw how other families lived, and he even adopted some of their routines, such as doing homework at night, watching the evening news, visiting the shopping plazas after school, wearing ironed clothes, and living in a house with electricity and indoor plumbing. The housing estate where his father lived had many more children than the beach, and these children were much more under the control of their parents. Many of them had a church-going lifestyle that seemed fun and interesting. After a while, Ramiro started to go to church on Saturday mornings with one set of neighborhood friends and on Sunday mornings with another set. Church had a lot of songs, memory games about scripture, sporting competitions, visits to other churches, and snacks and food. On Saturday afternoons and on some Sundays, he went to visit his father at the track where there were race meets. The security guards got to know him, so he was always allowed to slip in quietly without paying. In August, after he had lived with his father for three months, Sawdust changed his routine from looking after several horses to caring for only one. The horse that the owner and the trainer and the grooms in his stables believed was the most amazing talent to be bred on the island. Call me Thunder. The colt was being schooled and conditioned to do, to do his first run on Independence Day. So far, all of their work was being done in secret, and if all went well, they dreamed of him surpassing the achievements of the legendary Streak of Light, who collected all the major trophies for three-year-olds some thirty years ago. The trainer came that morning to collect Sawdust and Ramiro to take them to a farm where Call Me Thunder would exercise for the day. Also in the pickup was Briggy, the loud mouthed heavyweight jockey who was decked to ride him in the St. Ledger. The farm was only an hour's drive away, and Kami Thunder took the journey calmly. When the boxcar opened, he came out and trotted easily around the grounds without any sign of temper. They came to this farm to give him a very private field where he could have exercises at pace away from inquisitive eyes. For the early part, Ramiro was riding one of the retired race horses to run alongside him after his father took over. After that, his father took over. They put in a lot of work in the mornings, as the afternoons were prone to heavy showers which would ruin the ground for good flat running. They were very pleased when the caretaker told them that it had not rained for the past two days and that conditions were dry. After his first hard run, sawdust checked call me thunder for injuries and then put him in a paddock to rest when he noticed a figure standing under a guango tree to the side of call me thunder's box he approached a man from behind and became angry when he recognized the person as lance lodge a jockey who the racing commission had long suspected of race fixing 
but I never had enough material for a conviction. In the past few years, two promising mounts had mysteriously become injured after he rode them in big purse races. Lodge, what are you doing here? Lodge slowly and deliberately shifted to glance at sawdust and then glance away again. What, man? You keeping secret around here? Sawdust did not answer him. Lodge continued. Chucky promised that he would get me another big ass to rise. Right, I should mount this one. Forget it, him deck already. Lodge shrugged. He's strong his horse. I will ask him. Sawdust planted his legs firmly in the ground, crossed his hands over his chest and said in his quiet and low way, Left the place, Lodge. Not no dare for you today. Lodge hissed his teeth and walked towards the track. Is there a farm boy? Fair man will share bed with us. A lucky you lucky kid at this work. Sawdust grabbed the lodge's collar and slapped the back of his head. But no jockeys were notoriously nimble, and he hooked one of his muscular legs in between Sawdust's leg, causing him to lose his balance, and they both fell to the ground. Now having cancelled the sawdust's advantage of height, Lodge used his knee to ram into sawdust's belly, and when he flashed his knife, it was more than a bare threat. A lone gunshot nearby stopped the commotion. A stocky man in a worn leather hat lowered his hand from pointing in the air where he had fired the shot. It was Chungi, the owner of Call Me Thunder, and of the farm. Behind him, the trainer, Briggy, and Ramiro were running towards the scene. Why not kill off each other upon my farm? Lodge got up and pleaded with a sneer. Chungi, is look me come look for you and this man order me off of your farm? Lodge, me tell you already, when I'm ready for you, I will call you. This place look like any tourist attraction where people feel them can come and go as them like. It was a question that Chungi did not expect to be answered and Lodge certainly did not reply. Briggy, who felt the most threatened by the presence of the other jockey, jumped into the fray. Lodge, since you can't get horse for ride, is what? You turn agent 007 or the Secret Service you're working for now? Shut your mouth, Briggy, said Chungi. Lodge, go wait on me on the veranda. Lodge dusted himself as he walked off. Chungi called the trainer and the two of them drew away to speak in private close to where Call Me Thunder was standing in the shade. Sawdust hung his head down as he was still in pain from the blow from Lodge's knee. When he spoke, he said, I'm going to have trouble with Lodge. If he can't ride Call Me Thunder, he will make sure to mess up his chances. You think, you think Chucky will deck me out? Briggy sounded worried. Sawdust shook his head carefully. Not with this boy. Call me Thunder is too talented to put into the hands of a jockey who does not love horses. Chungi knows that. Call me Thunder was entered into the following Saturday's nine race program and Ramiro barely saw anything of his father as he put everything into his work to ensure that the horse perform performed well on his debut showing. On the race day, Ramiro ate breakfast with his father and shortly after six in the morning walked with him to Chungi's stables and together they travelled in the horse box with Call Me Thunder to the Augusta race course. For the past week, Ramiro watched as his father, as his father groomed the horse and his coat shone. The farrier and his assistant had come the day before and spent a long time doing minor but careful smoothing and levelling of the hoof walls. When he finished the rasping, the farrier said that all four feet were in good condition and then left. Their race was a fifth. From the third race, Sawdust walked Call Me Thunder to the parade so that the punters would see him. There were plenty exclamations as I saw Call Me Thunder's body for the first time and calculated how he might perform on the day. Although he was only three years old, his muscle and skeletal development were so far advanced that a heavyweight jockey like Briggy could mount him. The filly, restless babe, was a favorite, but the rest of the field was soft. It seemed a very safe bet to say that Call Me Thunder would finish in the top two, so punters marked him and restless babe for a quinella. 
That call me thunder look razor sharp, said one punter, leaning on the fence. Those big juice horses look promising, and then they let you down on the back stretch. I will hold my money on today and just watch him, said his friend, standing beside him. At another side of the parade, a female punter exclaimed, Why, this horse was nearly two thousand guineas. If he runs as good as he looks, this is what I come to see. At the starter's gun, all seven in the gate had a good start for the five thir furlong, one thousand meter race. Briggy, wearing Chungi's black and green colors, was nervous. When the horses came around the bend to the home stretch, the crowd saw when Call Me Thunder bunched up his forelock muscles and held the curve to emerge at the head ahead of the pack. He did not have the experience enough to adjust his gait for the straight, and the experience of restless babe showed through as she gathered her hooves and propelled herself ahead of him by under a length to the winging winning post. Ramiro listened as the men talked through the race. His father said that he was satisfied with the run. A win would have been great, but this was a solid start to a career. Briggis said that the horse was running well until Restless Babe passed him and he felt him strain to catch up, but it was too late. Briggy felt that Call Me Thunder wanted to win and that would help him to learn fast. Chungi agreed and that their job now would, was to bring out the champion in their athlete. He said that they would continue the work, and to him in a few more run-ups to the race that was a test of the best three-year-olds, the Caribbean St. Ledger. End of chapter 5